In this instalment of Let's Talk Toddlers, we'll be looking into how our toddlers develop emotionally. We've got these little people who essentially are full of emotion. Yes. Everything is about emotion. Yes. Yet they have no ability to regulate it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's exactly that what I'm saying. so much. What happens in the dark is they start to feel scared. They get anxiety in their bodies and they create something literal to be scared of. So what they're actually scared of is fear. I'm Emma, mum of three, play researcher, and I'm here with dad of five, Ben, and child psychologist, Dr. Marta, also a mum. So let's talk toddlers. Being a toddler parent is a bit like being a detective. So many of their outbursts just leave you thinking, where did that come from? There's just so much that they are processing. Dr. Marta, we know that in the early years, that is the biggest time of brain development. So yes. maybe that is a good place to start for us to try and figure out what is going on in their little minds. Well, the way that children are, particularly in the early years, is they are fully emotional beings. So their first kind of sense of the world is sensory. So they understand the world by how they feel in it. So both through like touch and vocal tone, and so sounds, anything like that, visuals. So it's all sensory. That's how they're processing, particularly babies and then into toddlerhood. So everything is emotional to them. You know, mm. they experience the world through emotion, which is why it's also such a key time to begin language around emotion and begin things around emotional literacy because they're like the building blocks. And also when we think about tantrums, one of the things that helps kids overcome them is the ability to express how they're feeling with words rather mm -hmm. than with behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those key times really. So what you're saying is we've got these little people who essentially are full of emotion. Yes. Everything is about emotion. Yes. Yet they have no ability to regulate it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's exactly that what I'm saying. so much, doesn't it, Ben? <laughs> exactly. They can't regulate it and they also can't speak to you, and certainly when they're much younger in their toddler years, and just explain how, how mm. they're feeling in that given moment. I think the transition period that is actually quite nice is when they are able to yes. start speaking. Yeah. And you know, that you know, you think back to the first time that your child might tell you that they're happy mm. or conversely that they're sad or, you know, whatever it might be. That's kind of, I guess, when you can see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. But before that, it can be just, you know, such a whirlwind trying to figure out what's wrong is there anything that you can do to help or is it just something that you you have to go through yeah I think that's so true that sort of period where they can't articulate it I found really difficult mm. um my youngest who is two now he was a head butter so he sort Aww. of expressed his feelings through his mm. forehead and it was really Aww. it was really stressful for a while because it was something that the other children hadn't done and he would just get so cross and also he's the youngest of three so I think yeah. he's living in a house where everyone in the house can articulate themselves and yeah. is able to converse and communicate and yeah that's how he expressed his frustration um but we've just tipped over into now he can name feelings and it is as you say that transitional period it is like night and day and actually the other night I was putting him to bed and he's always been really good at going to bed and suddenly doesn't want me to leave him which is Aww. quite unusual so I'm thinking oh what is this about um and I did manage to calm him down and I said I actually said to him do you feel scared? And he said, yes. And I said, what do you feel scared of? And he just went, lawnmowers. <laughs> 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 because earlier there'd been a, someone mowing their lawn, but it was dark. So he was trying oh. to get to the window to see the lawnmower, well, was, right. but he couldn't see it. So in yeah. his mind... There's just loads of really scary lawnmowers out there in the dark. Yeah. It's that sort of like detective work, like I was but saying. But it's also about how of... like their imagination plays tricks yes. on them. Yeah. So, I know, you know, it, their imagination is great with play and, you know, creating these stories. But it also plays these tricks on them where it creates fear and anxiety. Yes. So that's the other, like, that's the dark side of having a wild imagination. Yes. There's some like, I guess, universal things that kids are scared of. The yes. dark. Yes. monsters. So what? where does that come from? So it's to do with brain development. I think the dark one is such an interesting one because most kids get scared of the dark around, you know, 
between two and three, there's a moment where their brain starts to develop and change and they begin to get scared of the dark. And because their brain only knows concrete concepts, so literal things, they don't understand abstract, Mm. right? So things like time doesn't mean anything to them. And then what happens in the dark is they start to feel scared. They get anxiety in their bodies and they create something literal to be scared of. So I love that your child said lawnmowers, you know, like (laughs) random. Or what most kids say is, there's something in my room. Mm. Because I feel something in my body that says I'm scared. And they they can't quite articulate the fear, but they're like, my body doesn't feel okay. Mm. So there's something in this place that's not okay. So what they're actually scared of is fear. Mm. And when children respond in that, you know, kind of express that, our job as parents is just to hold their Mm -hmm. fear with them and kind of say, I'm here, you're safe. It's not about looking for the monsters, so don't join their imaginary world because when you do, you make their fear real. So instead, you want to just help your child understand you're safe, I'm here with you, I know you're feeling scared, like always validate their experience and then just give them, again, literal things like you're in your cosy bed, we're at home, mummy's here, whatever, your favourite teddy's here and that tends to bring kids back to calm and safety. So with the emotional development in toddlers, what what is actually happening during that time? And what kind of things can we be observant of as parents to sort of look out for and support them with? When we think about emotional development in terms of the brain, that doesn't fully mature until they're 25. Okay, so we're adults before our mature emotional brain switches on. But we need to see it as a process. You're not going to wait till they're 25 to teach them about emotion. You want to begin as early as possible. And it starts with, again, language. Name it. So name emotion. And it's great. You can use things like the Duplo characters. Some of the animals have little sad faces or some of the people look a bit annoyed or angry or happy. But you can use that as well as things like books. I love Mm. books with lovely pictures that you can name the emotion of the characters. Mm. Two, play it out. So I always talk about like role play. If one of the characters is sad, play it alongside it, you know, so that they learn to notice what it sounds like, you know, like, oh, you know, make a sad face or I'm angry, you know, and get big and tall. And it's really helpful to kids. And then the third, like the final process is when they start to understand that they have these emotions too. And so when they feel sad, when you name it and you say, oh, you look sad, or I can see you're really angry or you're frustrated, Mm. you know, you want to expand their vocabulary as well a little bit, Mm. then they can start to name it. They learn that from you right? We don't just learn emotion. It doesn't just happen. It is something you have to teach your child. Mm. Like if you never name emotion, you never say it, children don't learn it. So we do have to be a bit more active in talking about it. Wow. That is so interesting. When my daughter, she's nine now when she was three, she used to love this game where I would put my hands in front of my face. And then every time I would move them, I'd have a different expression. And she had to say what the, what the emotion was, but she'd come up with all different ones like spaghetti or like (laughs) um but yeah she loved that but it was also I think just so fascinating to her to get all of these different ways of describing the feelings um I've noticed Ben I don't know if this is the same for you as well because I know you also have a have a um an age gap so my eldest is 12 so it's quite a long time since I've been in the toddler years but I have observed that the education and what the content that's out there for parents is very much about validating the emotion. And that feels quite different to when I had my eldest yeah. a long time ago, where it was more about like discipline and naughty stuff. Yes. And now it feels like there's a lot of like sort of gentle parenting and holding space for the feeling. Um, and it feels like such a positive shift. I don't know if you've noticed that in your sort of journey yeah, as a dad. Definitely. I think there's... Um... It, there's been a real transition. Mm. I think children's mindfulness and the well-being side of things and the self-care yeah. is is very much, you know, um, very prevalent now. And I think, you know, we've got, um, I know we talked about um, activity books uh, previously, and I, we've got one that is, it's emoji-based. You know, we're all very familiar with the emojis mm. just yeah. on our, our phone. And, you know, Almost being able to for for the child to put a little sticker on that page describing how they're feeling that mm. day. It's like it just. Uh, this is something that I don't think I. Well, I'm not saying it didn't exist, but 
eight years ago when we first became parents, it certainly wasn't the yeah. wealth of material yeah. um, like that. And I just think it's really, really valuable. I think, again, from discussions with, with friends and, and other family members who have children, these conversations about children expressing how they're feeling definitely seem to be starting a lot earlier. Yeah. The first time that my now two-year-old sort of came over and was just saying that he was happy. And oh. but actually meaning it, you know, mm. because he was it was expressing the fact that he was happy based on a particular event that had happened. And the same with him feeling sad. And again, it's just I guess really nice to kind of nurture those conversations. Um, but I love what, what Dr. Marta was saying there, just about especially when they're I suppose sometimes with those emotions. As a thinking and a fully formed adult, we know that it's not rational and it yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. Getting into that argument with the child about, oh, well, there's nothing to be scared yeah. of mm. doesn't actually solve it no. really, does it? Because Often makes it worse. Yeah, you know, mm. then you are literally, it's them versus you. Mm. Um, so, but yeah. it's also meeting emotion with logic. Yeah. And if, even yes. for us, emotion is not logical. When you mm. feel emotional about something, you just feel it. It doesn't matter that it's like logical. Mm. And also think about the time you've just mentioned that example of a child being scared. So, you know... You wake up in the middle of the night to a child screaming their head off because they're they're scared in their room. Yeah. You've then got your own emotion, which is you've now just been woken up. Yeah. You're startled. You're tired. Yeah. yeah, you're going into a child that's talking about a monster under their bed that doesn't exist. You know that it. And it's I guess even just hearing you talking about that dialogue that you should be having with the child, I suppose as parents we have to sometimes think that we've got to regulate our emotions yeah, because really. it's not easy to have a chilled you know gentle no, conversation no. when when you're tired and when you know that something doesn't make sense yeah. but actually the the benefits of it and what's gonna the outcome of that is only going to be positive when you you do it the right mm -hmm. way and I think this transition to support children one that all feelings are good feelings you know there's no bad or good they just are yeah and that we can talk about them and then we're not going to label them as like naughty if you feel yeah, this or yeah. do you know what I mean? I think this is a huge transition for the adults of tomorrow having way better regulation skills than we have because as children we didn't get those conversations. Mm. And one of the one of the outcomes of good emotional literacy is that you're building empathy. Yeah. Because if you can recognize emotion in yeah. others, then you can connect with that. That's mm. what empathy is about. Mm. Empathy is about saying I don't feel how you do, but if I was in your position, I get it. I yeah. would feel that too. And I think there's nuance in this because I think I've had lots of adults say before, if we do that, we're modly coddling our kids. And I'm like, we're not. We're teaching them about emotions. Yeah. And just because you validate or you say to your child, that's how you feel, it doesn't mean you don't then support them to develop some coping strategies and, you know, develop emotional regulation from there. Yeah, gosh, it's so interesting, isn't it? I think um, there is this this complete shift and like one example how I see that show up in our house is when as I said my eldest is 12 so it was very much the era of the naughty step when he was a toddler and we were you know first time parents just sort of going with the flow and quite sort of formulated um you know how I wanted to approach things now so sort of started doing that and it always just felt so wrong so you know we sort of moved on now we're sort of much later and we've got our third we don't have a naughty step step we have a thinking sofa <laughs> <laughs> we have a thinking room in our house but essentially it is the sofa in there because sometimes he does have to be removed it's it's actually more for the sake of his siblings particularly mm. his sister like he, safety he will like mm. just whack her um and she gets very upset about it so we do have to sort of remove mm. him um from some situations and we go to the thinking sofa and we try and ask you know are you angry yes <laughs> <laughs> you know we sort of have those conversations but it definitely helps and i was i was thinking about this before i had this conversation and i was curious why being able to articulate the feeling yeah why it helps with that. There's two things going on. So one of them is that when you can communicate like with words and people understand you, you don't have to act it out. Like, I say this all the time to adults, but it's the same as if you have an argument with your partner, your wife, your husband, whoever you're with, 
and you're trying to put a point across and they're not listening to you. Often what happens is we just get louder. Mm. Like if you're trying to say something and you don't feel heard, you just keep escalating it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't just go quiet because somebody didn't understand you. And little ones with their big feelings do exactly that. They're like, I'm trying to communicate something to you. I can't express it with words. So I'm just going to act it out so mm. you can hear me. And you can't ignore a kid who is screaming. Like it's really hard to ignore children when they're in their big feelings. So that's one, right? If we can speak, then the behavioral component can like shrink mm -hmm. because it's not necessary anymore. You can have, I love that. You can sit with your son like you do on the thinking sofa <laughs> and say, what's going on here? I can tell you're very angry. And he goes, yes, that's wonderful. Like mm. you, that's the building block, mm. right? The second thing is, their brains are under construction. So children are not born with complete adult mature brains. And for that reason, when we tap into language, we're developing a different area of the brain from that the emotional centers. And what we're doing is allowing for the development to reach that maturity for emotional regulation. So it is doing something to develop their brains. Mm. You know, it's allowing centers to turn into communication. When we shut down emotional expression you know they're like rah and you go you're naughty go go mm. on the naughty step for example we're shutting them down yes. so they're not doing that development mm. the learning they're also not being heard mm. so rather than being like okay my mum my dad my sibling has understood that I'm mm. angry they're like nobody gets that I'm angry so I'm still angry mm. but now yeah. I'm just by myself mm. with it and I want to say on that note that if you have used time out, you have not harmed your child in a detrimental way. <laughs> I heard you say that and I thought, there's so many parents who've used it. Yeah. And also in the UK, most schools use it. Now, I'm not a fan no. at all. I think that time has passed. Yeah. I also trained parents in using it. But how I trained parents in, through my kind of professional training is very different to how it was sold in the media. Yeah. So I have a problem with it because I think families have used it in the way that they thought was best mm. because that's what we all do as parents. We do our best. But I feel like it wasn't sold like in a useful way. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you've harmed your child. What it might mean is you can always go back. Yeah. Like I always say this, you can start from wherever you are. Yeah. You can still build that language, you know, development, communication mm. and... You can still build emotional regulation. Mm. Even if you're 85, you can still build emotional regulation. Yeah. So it's never too late. Yeah, it is so true. The consequences of trying to um, suppress the emotions, of keeping them yeah. bo bottled in, are like really, really not good. Well, over time, they just grow yeah. because they don't learn how to communicate it. Yeah. I think one of the characteristics or skills even that a lot of parents are looking to nurture in their kids is resilience. Mm -hmm. How do we build resilience? And of course, it's not something that can actually be taught. It's something that is experienced through um, just, just living and playing and being. And I think it's really interesting to think about um, how we can use play to help our children experience things like persistence. So when they are trying to put a couple of Duplo bricks together, actually that is quite difficult at first and yeah. then it becomes possible. And in that kind of experience, they've you know shown that persistence and experience resilience. And play is just an incredible space and um, way that children learn resilience. Have you seen that with your kids, Ben? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, there's certain tasks, as you mentioned, that are very easy to do or there's others that they struggle with and then there's that sense of achievement once you know they are able to build a tower any kind of toy where you have to manipulate and do something with is really great for building frustration tolerance i would always say you want to start really small with little ones okay if you make the frustration too high if the task is too hard mm, yeah. they're not learning anything mm. and they're just going to get mm. distressed also if you see that your child gets very frustrated very easily on on a task like this one of the best things to do is one join them not in the frustration but in the kind of creation and you want to do the smallest step possible because I think as an adult as a parent one of the our instincts is we'll fix it you know yeah. you can't build it that's fine I'll build it for you you know like this is how you do it look I'll mm. show you but actually what you're doing is doing it slow that down we mm. always want to make things easier than they can do mm. and then we let go you know you build mm. confidence that way so just remember that as well because it's really helpful mm. and I think parents can jump in too quickly to fix it 
Yeah, I mean, it can be pretty painful sitting I know. there and watching. <laughs> I know, it's painful. <laughs> Trying to do a puzzle or but It's a good test for our own patients. The great thing about toys like the G-Play sets and the G-Play characters is that they can be taken down and put up again. Yes. So with play experiences, what we really want children to have is to experience essentially like taking risks and experimenting. Yes. This is obviously very early stages of that in, in these kind of toddler years. But yeah, they're able to put a different head on a different body yes. and try that out and have those very early experiences of essentially, yeah, risk-taking and experimentations. And also persistence, mm. right? So they're doing the same thing, but in different ways yeah. over and over and over again. And that's how they build skills. Confidence is something that is so sought after and desired by parents. And it's something a lot of parents worry about if their children maybe yeah. don't seem as confident as other children. And it's it's a very sophisticated, quite um, mature skill. And it really is a journey. But having these little moments in play where they experience each time being able to achieve something, that is just all kind of like almost going into this like confidence stash that they've got and we want to have them coming back for the fun and doing that over and over again so that confidence just grows for me it's about building a growth mindset you know this idea of you make a mistake and it's not a failure it's a point of learning so you know the tower crumbles you learn something from yep. that next time you might build the tower in a different way or you might yeah. build a bridge on it or whatever it is does that make sense so what we're building is confidence in trying things yeah. out confidence in making mistakes yeah. and not falling apart you know that confidence of i made a mistake but actually that's taught me something what can i do next time that's the real kind of confidence that i think holds our kids strong mm. as they go through the challenges of life and even though we're only talking about two Toddlers, three year olds yeah. it's happening it's happening, it is happening there with this yeah yeah definitely a huge thank you to today's guests and of course all our listeners. This is Let's Talk Toddlers created by Lego Duplo.